hello, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Artist Space Books and Talks. My name is Richard Burkett. I'm the curator at Artist Space. Um, I hope you've had the chance to view our current exhibition. It's the last day of Tom of Finland Pleasure of Play, both at Green Street and the, uh, here at Walker Street upstairs. Uh, but this afternoon, we're also very pleased to have collaborated with Alejandro Cesarco and the staff at ART Press uh, in presenting this book launch for Double Bind, uh, a book by art historian Rhea Anastas and artist Leela Dare. The publication centers on an extensive conversation between the authors concerning Ladere's project uh, from 2009-2010, uh, bearing the same title, Double Bind. This project was published as an artist book in 2012 and first exhibited uh, in New York in 2014 at Mitchell Innes Nash as an installation. It comprises over 1,000 photographs of the artist's ex-wife, half of these taken by Ladere, the other half by her current husband, according to a script conceived by Ladere, alongside a collection of printed mass media. Today's discussion is intended to extend the intention and ideas activated within Raya and Lee's published conversations, and to make connections with other practices and perspectives. Towards this end, Raya and Lee have invited three further participants uh, to join them and contribute to the discussion. Artists Daniel Boschkoff, Kate Hardy, and John Miller. Uh, we're very grateful to Daniel, Kate, and John's willingness to join this event, and I'm sure their insight and responses into the terms of work in the book will lead to a wide-ranging discussion. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read biographies for all the participants, but you can find those on the program notes that are upstairs. Um, and also upstairs, obviously, is the book, Double Bind. Uh, we really hope that you'll uh, purchase one before you leave. And also, Rhea and Lee will be signing books at the end afterwards, so please join us for some drinks and the signing session afterwards. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the participants, the speakers today. Thank you again to them. you guys hear me? Okay, so I thought I'd start off just by reading the basic conceptual script of the project. Um, it reads, Double Bind, convince my ex-wife to go alone with me for three nights to a remote cabin upstate New York. Married for five years, but now divorced for five years. She agrees, but gets remarried before we leave. I stay with her and photograph her over the course of the four days. This results in roughly 500 images. We sleep in different beds, most time we've spent together in five years. Two months later, pay for Megan to return with her current husband to the same cabin, three nights again. He also happens to be a photographer, photographs her for four days, brings me 14 rolls of unprocessed film. I process and print all 1,000 photographs over the course of the next 10 days. This results in two sets of images. My images of my ex-wife appear on black. His images of his new wife appear on white. This makes up the first comparative structure. The two sets of photographs are then positioned against a collection of media images and other ephemera. This makes up the second comparative structure. Um, so the images that we're showing are the images from, from the actual Double Bind book upstairs, which are all installation shots taken from the show at Michelinas and Mass. And they they just basically perform a kind of walkthrough of, of that show, um, really trying to sort of spatialize the, the work. And we can kind of let it play as we discuss. But there are kind of basic elements that Richard mentioned early on. Um, these two sets of images um, contained in two smaller vitrines, and then a large collection of mass media ephemera, maybe 6,000 clippings that occupy a large vitrine. Um, and those two sets of images are always placed together in a kind of color-coded orientation. So my images of Megan appear on black panels, and her current husband, Adam Federley's images of Megan appear on the white panels. So. I guess I 
should say the period of working on the book actually spans two different installations of the work. So I first saw it in Los Angeles at the box in 2012. And um, just so, you know, and it ended up two years later that this exhibition happened and actually we were still working on the book during the exhibition. I mean, the project itself, we thought of doing it, I guess, the fall before the New York show. But I kind of came to the work through seeing it, having experience in the installation. So I think that's sort of interesting background information. And um, it was kind of like a starting point for us talking about your work. And in the dialogue, we were kind of drawing a lot from those two different stagings of the piece. And then when we had the manuscript in hand, we were actually in the Mitchell Innes and Nash installation a lot. It's kind of a strange thing to do when you're writing something. We actually like had the text with us and we were in the galleries. Kind of, There's certain sections where we're talking broadly about ideas and then other sections where we're dealing with the framed panel. So we actually kind of did a lot of writing and editing work like in the same space with the objects. Can I uh, yeah. just ask a basic question? Um, in, in what way do you see the situation as a double bind? Or um, maybe just to clarify that, because I think of double bind being a sort of situation where you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, the title comes from the sort of Bateson idea of the double bind, which is this, yeah, this question where you have one sort of directive to do something directly contradicted by another directive. So maybe someone telling you to do something and then their body language says the opposite. And so you're really kind of caught in a, in a, in a kind of bind where neither way is correct. Um, I think that, I think there are different levels where that operates. I think it could be seen in terms of what it meant for each of the participants to actually partake in the structure, to submit themselves as a sort of functionary in a way to performing um, the structure of going on, the, going on each trip. Um, inside of the kind of complex triangle that, that occurs between the individuals. And then I think that there's another sort of way in which that double bind has to do with a sort of reception model or viewing, and perhaps a position that the work places the viewer in. So what, like more specifically, are the viewer's alternatives then? I, I, um. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I guess it's, I guess it's, it's not necessarily alternatives, but that the viewer is in, in looking at the work, it's, it's very, very difficult to resolve exactly what your feeling of it is based on how the sort of affect in the work functions. Do you, do you want to maybe mention? Well, well, there's the kind of live, there's the kind of real acting problem, right? There's a private performance that's taken place, you know, before and during and surrounding the shooting of the black and whites, and the viewer doesn't have any access to what's happened, right? The viewer can only see this photographic residue, and a thousand photographs seems like a lot, but, you know, or two sets of 500, but over three days with these two couples with each other, obviously so much happened that we're not seeing in the frames, right? So one of the things that we try to do almost in a kind of, um, it's sort of risky and it's not what our criticism usually does. We speculate a lot. We try to get into this, bound, this borderline with, with, the sen with works that have this kind of performance where I'm kind of speculating about what Adam and Megan were feeling, kind of we're giving ourselves like a lot of fictional license to kind of like open up the space of what was happening and to use that as like one way of kind of extending out the problem of, for the viewer, like one first problem for the viewer, which is like you weren't there, you don't know what happened, and then you're confronted with these images, and then there's also this basic juxtaposition, which is the, you know, the so-called private images, and then all the mass media images, so you're also caught you know, you're, you're dealing with the, the role, the mar you know, the couple, the married couple, you're dealing with gender roles, and I, what I would call a kind of social typing is occurring, and then you don't really know where you stand or where that imagery stands in relationship to the mass cultural imagery because there's so much kind of stereotype and all kinds of social typing going on that's sort of surrounding you. So, I, I mean, the viewer is kind of confronted with this problem of what kind of images to feel bad about or feel good about or somewhere <laughs> something in between um, yeah, maybe a whole also range. 
maybe also in the production of the images also, what does it mean to participate in these very things and produce those images versus what does it mean to actually have a kind of critical understanding of feminist critiques of images such as those? Yeah, that, that's what I, with Double Bind, I really thought it was the kind of the position that you were putting yourself into as an artist and kind of, you know, enacting or explicating this um, sexual politics mm -hmm. and kind of, you know, potentially, you know, producing problematic images or, you know, being a part of it, but, you know, needing to, in a way, to see, you know, what's at the core of that, of those sexual politics and that kind of representation. So I thought more on like a personal level. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I when I saw the show at the box, okay, I, we'd, I, we'd never met. I viewed the show and thought about it for a couple of months before we talked. When I was in that space, um, you know, I was kind of asking myself this question, is this a feminist work of art? I, I thought I had been looking at, working on a couple of other things, some photographic series Josephine Pride had taken and also Andrea Fraser's performance, Untitled. And I kind of felt like when I walked into the gallery, I was in a really similar conversation as I was with those two projects where it was um, art that was transmitting a set of feminist um, practices and politics and it was kind of asking the question by confronting me with these gender types of kind of like what the question was being asked and it was a political question, but also like my politics and responses were also put on the line. But it's, it was really a question, and I tried to, I, you know, I, there's this issue of, um, it's a whole range of exploring that. I wasn't sure that it was a feminist work of art. I wasn't sure that it wasn't a feminist work of art. It was kind of a process that started to try to figure out. But I knew it had to do something with that. That was like one tradition that I could go to to try to think through what I was looking at, right? That might have been the one that you went to. I sort of, in a way, did go running to, um, like your images, Kate and A.L. Steiner's. I kind of would check myself and go look at a bunch of other kind of images that yeah. didn't have such uh, potentially sexist or patriarchal elements, right? And, and sort of, I also happened to be thinking about that work at the time, you know, and I would sort of, it was like a, it was strange. I mean, I was kind of bothered by it. Well, it seems like the, the work, um, throws out these patriarchal terms in the form of a, a quasi-experiment. And, um, you know, some of the, one of the terms is that uh, uh, Megan, the woman in question, is kind of a vehicle for <coughs> exchange. Mm -hmm. um, she doesn't represent herself. There's two men who represent her. Um, but it's, um, it's sort of devious that it's couched as an experiment, you know, because then it's like resonating with uh, societal norms in a way. And, um, uh, and, and one thing that makes me laugh thinking about it too is the idea of uh, going to, uh, what was it, a um, house upstate or something? It, yeah, yeah. it made me think of Walden or something like that, and, and also <laughs> like a control and an experiment. like. Oh, we'll, we'll get away from all the social distortion and have this like key moment in isolation in the woods or something like that. And then we can see like what purely happens in this transaction. Um, so there's yeah. kind of a mocking of um, scientific conventions too. Yeah, and then the way the authorship structure puts into play this sort of triangle is very important because you know, on one hand, every image of Megan you could understand as a sort of index of Megan, and on the other hand, you have to understand each of those images as a product of either one relationship or the other relationship, and it's always, it's always kind of, um, there's always this kind of third sort of present person in the background, or the camera functions almost as a sort of stand-in for that third person because it's recording and then transmitting the information to them. So. Mm -hmm. In, in a sense, in a sense, you have this, um, you have a kind of structure created that unfolds in time, starting with the, me actually going to them and proposing them this project, which sort of set into play a number of different responses 
that kind of couldn't be taken back at that point. Mm -hmm. And then they ended up agreeing to participate. The first trip was taken, followed by a secondary trip, which had something to say not only about their relationship, but also about the first trip and also about the format of the entire sort of experiment. I was, oh, sorry. I, I was just wondering if there were terms to that agreement that we don't know about or that aren't in the book. <laughs> in in what way? In what way? <laughs> what would your terms be? <laughs> no, between you and your your ex-wife and the new new guy. I mean, like I'm like, well, I mean, if he's a photographer, does he have rights to these photos? Like how? Yeah. Like I mean, you know, there's it's complicated, and I mean, was there like okay, like she can take off her clothes? Or she can't. I mean, no. was there like things that you talked about that you know? No, we. It it was really sort of left. It was left open. You know, it was. Um, you know, and the kind of odd thing is, is they could have participated in it any way they pleased. You know, within the confine, like they could have gone there, had me pay for them to take this vacation, and come back with no photographs at all, and that would have been somehow part of what the project became. So. So there was a kind of um, openness to it at the same time as maybe, you know, it may have been predictable in some, some way how she responds in the situations. Um, does he photograph her regularly? He, I think he does photograph her regularly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just curious. Isn't that, isn't that a question he should answer? <laughs> well, I'm just curious about her subjectness or her objectness, you know, like on a bigger level, because, you know, I mean, you yeah. just start want to kind of write it out, and, you know, I mean... Well, she's um, not. She's not not knowing about imagery. I mean, she's kind of a fashion person, right? I mean, you have to understand yeah. that she's she's like well yeah, aware. Yeah, she was a photographer well before aware, as well. Yeah, and she was trained as an artist, yeah. right? So she's kind of well aware of how she wants to handle like her side of being photographed, and she's like involved as, as a profession in like a lot of construction I th of images. I think there's another <laughs> sort of question too that maybe even comes before that, which is the question of of how, how are each of the participants using this sort of rubric of, of these two trips? You know, what are they, and, it's, and that's a layer of sort of speculation in the piece that it kind of opens on to, but. Yeah, we, we were really adamant about not doing a biographical interpretation, right? Okay, and so we, we, we really never go into backstory about any of the participants. We're interested in what happens at, you know, on the viewer side. We go back into speculating about the private performance to think about it conceptually. Um, but we do disclose one fact, and, the, and I think that it's a little bit, we do it because it shows the fact that the performers get involved in a situation, of course they know each other, and the piece would be totally different if the performers didn't know each other so well and so long, right? You can't, it just changes the nature of the project. But um, they did go ahead and get married in between the trips, right? And no, they got married. You knew they were engaged. There's they were engaged when I asked them, and then two weeks before her first trip with me, she got married to Adam. Okay, she got married before yeah. both trips. Okay, so I mean that, you know, so that kind of just shows a little bit of the relationship and, and psychological responsiveness. It's like the minute this thing was discussed, it's impacting all three people and the sets of relationships between them. But I'd assume that marriage is a key point in the work. Is that right, or...? Yeah. 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 But, but also, but also this, this sort of, these kind of types and identities as husband and wife and ex-husband and how that kind of, how those things sort of pivot around. And in, you know, for instance, how I come to occupy, or how he occupies a position I occupied earlier, and how abstractly, at least, we overlay each other in these roles. Yeah, because it, yeah, when I first um, saw the piece, I was thinking like, well, it's, it's kind of about transgressing marriage. But then over the summer, I read something that George Bataille wrote, uh, I consider marriage to be a transgression. And, um, yeah. you know, which is kind of like putting, totally putting the shoe on the other foot. 
Um, but in the way I interpreted it with like Bataille's sense of eroticism, like thinking about Freud's critique of kissing, like kissing is perversion. And um, I think Bataille was looking at monogamy the same way, that it's an, it's an unnatural uh, set of circumstances, mm -hmm. so transgressing and um, natural sexuality, so to speak, whatever that may be. Yeah. I'm very interested in how this uh, uh, sort of parative experiment that you were talking about earlier get kind of exacerbated by, by the double, by, by the, the, <laughs> the ex-husband and the, 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 the husband, you know. This sort of, is it, is it marriage or, or those categories, husband, wife, uh, ex-husband are, are kind of like some kind of stable thing that you can actually study and you uh, also just the way the, 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 the kind of the, the whole system is set by kind of uh, and how do you study it you go to a place but also you get like a equal amount of film and every single <laughs> photograph is so there's some kind of like incredibly kind of vicious at the end kind of parody of like a, what you can probably learn from the whole thing yeah. I mean <laughs> something reminds me very much and I think uh, I think Lee is a probably uh, that's kind of a his kind of Warholian heritage here, where that, that kind of, that amount of complicity becomes like really deviant at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, once it gets to be, you know that difference between like a, uh, let's say rep repetitive and repetitious, for instance, where, where sort of like a, in the middle of that there is this category of redundancy that you almost like have way too many images for you to kind of, you know, be even studying. <laughs> you're, you're kind of like overstudying something to the point of like impossibility in a way. And for me, not that, that that keeps you at some kind of a mute point, but certainly kind of from the beginning sets the, the mode of the, whole, of the whole inquiry. It almost like makes it, uh, not necessarily parodic, but kind of like a wonderfully sort of like a, a dysfunctional from the beginning, kind of like a tripping over its own kind of premises. There's this way. thing Flusser said too about um, constant newness being the most redundant thing actually. Mm. Which like the most redundant thing is this constant newness, this sort of cycles of newness in fashion or... or um. But also how that redundancy actually becomes like a, it's part of the material, just, just the way the, let's say, the main uh, possibly material or body of material here is not necessarily, uh, you know, series of photographs, but actually complicity is the material. Or, or the kind of the, not even the method, but the stuff we, we make things out of. Complicity towards these kind of like a assumed roles by the viewer. The viewer kind of makes this uh, kind of projected judgments and somehow, like in some of the older pieces, expects like a Lee or somebody to make some kind of like a further judgment. And nobody makes a judgment. You can't actually get like a, there's no bottom line of kind of, of category. There's no ethical sort of like a, you know, finalization of anything. So that, frustration of that is actually very active for me place to be you know kind of extra almost like a no sorry <laughs> being able to almost like excavate that kind of like a um, irritation out of categories that you seem you settle for who cares about husband you know whatever suddenly I'm kind of mad again like what does it mean like an ex-husband you know I mean it's uh, yeah well, I think those are also the points of resonance with the, with the mass media images and the pornography, too. It's like, I, then, you know, is the behavior modeled on that, or, right. or what's the relationship there? Sure. I mean, I, I thought about the, the mass media. Um, I didn't get to see it in Stahl. I just saw it in books. But so I kind of formed my own ideas about the mass media and just saw it as you or like as a kind of um, comparison or like a, you know, something to a complicitness to the type of imagery that you're producing, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I, I think I saw it, I think I read it as an, al like I tried to phrase it as a sort of allegory. Um, and thinking about like also in that triangular structure, structure of the private images, how you have to understand each image within this sort of ecology of other kind of group dynamics, mm -hmm. then also all the representations that you see in the mass media kind of have to be understood in that way somehow too. Right. So it becomes it becomes something that privileges rather than the the content of the thing in the actual magazine image. It privileges the context. Anyway. Yeah. 
So um, do you and Rhea see your discussion as part of the work or an extension of it? Um, and um, I'm thinking like, well, the, you know, the premise is very structured and then um, I'm inclined to see the discussion as, as part of the work. And I, I think about um, a precedent, uh, say with art and language where yeah. uh, the art historian Charles Harrison was part of the working group. So there's like a very kind of conceptual art tradition or uh, convention even to, to what you guys are doing. Um, so the, if that's the case, do you see like your discussion having, and, and maybe this also is in response to the points that Daniel was raising, um, does that create like some kind of like moral ground or finalization or does it stay open or? I think are, this, are, is, this is part of that ongoing continued discussion too. Our talk here yeah. too. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so it's tautological. I might be able to circle back to the art and language thing. I don't know my techniques, Charles Harrison's techniques. I don't know. But um, I think maybe more to connect to what Daniel was saying. Um, okay, this, this sort of dualism of control, loss of control, judgment, moralism. I think um, the intention from the beginning was to try to imagine um, a way of writing about art that kind of would just reject those dualisms and this idea of a kind of judgment seat and would, um, like it's kind of, what does this piece ask for as a kind of discourse that seems to be built as some extension from the work itself and um, you know, this question of complicity. So okay, if there's no judgment seat and nobody has the moral, nobody has the moral high ground we try to sort of play that out in relationship to the way discursive frameworks usually work, and it's usually pretty asymmetrical. Like you've got a work of art, and it's considered like untheorized or under-theorized, and then a writer comes around with their ideas about like what philosophical and art historical and other critical theory-based lineages they're going to kind of put onto the work, and it might be a confrontation, and it might be handled well by the writer, and it might be handled badly, but there's kind of an assumption that there are these two different things, that the work itself isn't like already theorized. I mean, that's where the tradition of conceptualism comes in, because right, artists were self-theorizing, artists are intellectually active, they've already kind of got in this work a bunch of ideas they're thinking about, it comes from critical writing. So, you know, then the writer is kind of just like out on the margins that job to do, if the job is described as finding like one language to describe the work is not the job to do. So we actually tried to, um, okay, so not work from this position of what we're performing is um, intellectual and cultural competency, right? Like actually neither of us, we didn't want to perform that. We wanted to kind of unperform that and say, what is the competency to write about this work and to view it? And that's why we tried to sort of put so there wasn't one theoretical discourse that ran all the way through. There was sort of a multiplicity. Um, there was this feminist politic that ran all the way through. But that, for me, that was about transmitting a lot of practice and theory um, from a kind of feminist transmission of knowledge that had to do with like viewing in an embodied way and kind of constantly bringing your viewership and your response like into conflict, into active conflict and active critique with whatever symbolic formation you're dealing with is. So the ground was experience in a way, and we actually tried to think of Lee, even though you were a participant, and you made the piece, like why can't he just be another viewer of the piece, you know, in the same way that Charles Harrison can sit around with art and language and they can kind of have e be equal partners in the production of the reception of the work, right? Why can't you just come out of the production side and sit on the reception side and well, frame that's this conversation, and then we built it up yeah. with, in a bunch of deliberate ways to try to really reject this idea that art writing is performance of a competency that we already know and to actually think about you know like un unknowing and, and other like just a lot of different ways to like move around knowledge and, and kind of not a patriarchal way but I think also I mean there's a kind of, there's a kind of way that by taking all that st all this sort of stereotypes and placing them in a, in the sort of foreground through kind of this enactment of the very thing that you're critiquing doing but in a very self-reflexive self-conscious way that it allows like a you know it 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 allows um a, a necess like it makes it necessary for a viewer to sort of attune themselves to what's being presented to them but also 
me as a sort of author and also the other authors in the work. You know, I think that there's a way I even, I don't have a complete understanding of everything that's happening because I can see it through these different lenses and because ultimately the piece is really destabilizing, you know. I mean, I, I, I read it as kind of processing, you know, just I like what Ria said at some point in the book. Uh, for a while, almost like identifying, uh, identifying Megan as a, this kind of bastion of privacy in this uh, almost like a sea of uh, media images. And how much that bastion is actually not protected at all. It's actually uh, almost like a, it becomes almost like another springboard for us to appreciate uh, what exactly is, is our understanding of subjectivity, how subjectivity is actually formed. It's almost without, it's almost like after encountering the work, almost like you, you cannot anymore in any way kind of like a, fool yourself that subjectivity is something actually not only stable, but something singular. It always seems to be uh, in the, um, whatever, in the unfolding of the work, subjectivity being this kind of almost like a interrelational sort of like at least triangle, if not mm -hmm. more than that. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, the bastion of privacy quickly becomes kind of incorporated into this other very kind of non-private constructed images and becomes constructed itself. So from that point of view, it's almost like a, what John said before, like a, you use the word tautology uh, in relation to this conversation maybe, whatever. I wouldn't even, I mean, it's sort of like a, maybe it's more like this kind of like a self of unfolding of the work that keeps kind of like, almost like a, the work that from the beginning is structured like that, that you need to kind of like a, go through this kind of like number of, triangulation in order to kind of like almost like get into the mode of its unfolding. Yeah. It, it never quite, it's almost like yeah. kind of impossible to stop. Um, which I'm, I'm very curious to kind of uncover further. What, 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 that, what is that, that type of material? What, what kind of a system do you set up that keeps doing that? You know, why did that happen? Um, that but type of... Yeah, it seems to me though too but that that's what culture does. You <coughs> know? Mm -hmm. Culture transmits itself. You know, it creates, it creates kind of operations that create future operations. Or something. Right. Yeah, but for me, uh, the interesting thing is like a, once there is this kind of like a ongoing, uh, almost like this kind of recognition of this kind of like a constant typecasting, that almost like a, all the time there are all these kind of roles around that are available for one to reperform. Mm -hmm herself or himself, you know, uh, in a way, what are the, not necessarily what are the choices, but um, I'm, I'm kind of like a wonderfully lost about the premise of the whole thing, like, you know, in other words, um, and, and in, a, in, a, in a weird way, kind of that disorientation, uh, we talked about before yeah. about that, like I, I, at some point, started thinking about the eternal husband of uh, Dostoevsky uh, there, because in his characters, there, there is that kind of like a, you know, the characters constantly find themselves like a, uh, baffled by their own actions. They don't know why this is happening, and they're saying it. So there's this constant kind of admission or recognition that like, I actually do not know myself as a subject. I do not know my, my premises. I have to look out and reflect in somebody else to have to tell me or react at me, with me, against me, for me to, at all kind of, I need to be incorporated in the system of that in order to actually gain some knowledge at all. Um, yeah. No, I totally agree. I mean, the, I, I still come away from the project thinking that the political problem is a problem about subjectivity and the ground of trying to think through it is an experiential ground. We didn't, like we couldn't even be secure. We didn't go to one language. We, tr like you know, Lee knows more about psychoanalytic theory than I do. We tried on a bunch of things there, like projection and inner projection, and we tried to use some psychoanalytic definitions of experience. So it's like if you feel it and it's your perception, it's kind of true and real and 
that never comes up in art criticism, but that's why we allow all of this kind of projecting onto the work. And I think it does help with Lee's work to get you out of that moralistic position that's always self-correcting, right? So mm -hmm. almost like this fake ther therapeutic thing with whatever, whatever kind of thing that you're projecting onto the work is, that's like a real thing that we can talk about, right? And then those things get multiplied. Um, but we did, yeah, it's, it's, it's sort of where we are right now with political arguments and theorizations of subjectivity and um, yeah we worked a lot with um, I don't know some older 70s feminist material also some some this kind of um, subjectivity of neg negativity that's a place where some people who are in queer theory cross with someone like Fred Moten um, and the Stefano Harney Fred Moten book where they're really but it's what you're saying it's actually a debate about subjectivity that goes way Way, pulls way, way back from any idea of the collective and goes way, right back to like the kind of individual subject and interiority and, and I mean, yeah, and it's really actually trying to work it up from privacy and to make kind of a counter argument. It's totally against basically all the post-war theory that we have that's evolved in the society of control and it's evolved in systematization. It's actually sort of starting the questioning again from a set of questions about what privacy and interiority are like approaching them with a very political understanding though, like that they are basic expressions. They are like sites from which agency and other kinds of political expression are gonna take shape. But that's why, um, you know, the informal, you know, just like a lot of, there's, there's a lot of different terminology that could be used that people are testing out. Um, Moten and Harney work with the informal a lot as well, self-organized. Um, it's, it's kind of a complicated terrain, but that gives a little bit of a sketch of where we were, some things we were trying to think in relationship to. The one, well, the one thing I'm a little bit wary of is thinking of individual subjectivity as a building block, that that comes first and it precedes um, a socialization process. So I would argue for trying to see that <coughs> Um, yeah, in a more collectivized way, and um, or in a more socialized way, or something. No, it's like never that. not. It's never no. not social. It's not a directional thing where one thing comes before the other. It's just um, a different way of thinking about scale. It's just about scale, actually, right? Mm -hmm. The scale is always nested in the largest possible scale, but it's about giving yourself a range of scale, so you can go from something that's scaled down and then figure out how it gets scaled up. I don't know, it's also just to get out of the exhaustion of some of those discourses, right? Did you, um, well, I had a couple questions. Um, yeah. When you made the first trip with Megan, did, did you guys, um, discuss critically what was going on? Did you have like theoretical discussions as well as shooting the photographs and spending time together? Um, we did, but it was, it was kind of coming together at that point. So in the, I had maybe four meetings with her and Adam prior to them agreeing. And so what we did discuss was that we would each be sort of like you know, in a way, lending ourselves to to the project in order to raise a set of questions around it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't cast in terms of um, depicting our own autobiographical experience, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was coming out of also, I don't know, you know, like having made the work with my mother and having feeling really this like strong expectation to make something very autobiographical again. Mm -hmm. I wanted to cast it differently. So, so what I did in this situation, instead of making a kind of diachronic kind of explication of who Megan was, who I was in relation, and who Adam was, instead I basically cast it as these, as these kind of cuts, you know? So there was one temporal space where these photographs were taken, and it was as much about using the camera as a kind of feedback mechanism to kind of so that we would sort of push each other around in the space or there was some kind of recording of like cognitively how, how she um, responded to the premise and what, how that kind of act of 
photographing unfolded, and that's one of the reasons for all the images being displayed. So, yeah. well, also I think that's how the rules function that it keeps it from being biographical, but it still puts weight on it being documentary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like a very kind of um, yeah synchronic structure, mm -hmm. as you were suggesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I mean the the setup is you know it's slightly disturbing. It's something that you have to deal with that two guys that you know have some kind of ownership o over you know, represent, representing this woman because you're married and you kind of sort of have a right or some way this intimacy, this access to her. Um, and, you know, that's, uh, you know, and I, I see that as this um, disturbing, like, confrontation, like, uh, regarding sexual politics that you, com you know, were complicit in setting up, you know? Yeah. And that, as part of the work that kind of it's keeps it off balance, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think it's also, um, yeah, I mean, there are two things I would say, which one being inside of that structure, Megan presents herself differently to each of us. You know, on one hand, a lot of what she presents to me is actually like a sort of refusal to present herself in some way. So there's this kind of resistance that becomes palpable. Whereas in the images that Adam's taking of her, there, there's like a large sort of variety of images, but partly, you know, especially in some of the more eroticized images, there's this kind of complex way in which, which she's allowing him to photograph her and there's a permission to look, yeah. which at the same time defines my position in a different way. Um, but I mean, didn't you expect that a little bit? It was, it was one of the potential outcomes, but I think the other thing I was going to get at is, is what it means to sort of to enact that, what it means to actually stage that. And I guess it's a question of how kind of affect functions in the work. In a way, I saw that move as a move actually against photography's, like the, the permissions that photography sort of allows for people to act out and expose themselves and place some sort of sells forward in this way, especially especially now at this sort of moment in social media too, you know. Yeah, it brings forward a lot of questions around that. Well also it's kind of really complicated because like a, you're talking about permissions to look being different between the husband and the ex husband. But then what does this do to the viewer? Are these two levels of permission for the viewer, or the viewer are constantly also, uh, the viewers are, are, are kind of like a facing their own sort of like a, in a way, uh, often preconceived, you know, kind of like a, in a way, rejections of that, or, 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 or sort of judgments over that. Which, it, it, it's almost like a, there's this ripple effect that, that happened there, that, that it's sort of like a, I, I must say like a, I've seen very few pieces that one, one is so kind of implicated as a viewer viewer like like continuing to look at this you're already kind of weirdly part of the part of the game you, you you're not a uh, even if you have like the most critical or any other kind of pre prepared eye um, the work kind of in a slippery way kind of like a sucks you in into its own kind of not only ambiguity but but uh, um, that kind of like re refusal to to position or fi to finalize a position. I have to say I was interested in using that as a technique <clears throat> in scholarship and criticism, and I think that totally contradicts the kind of conceptualist model where people are getting together in a critical, analytically detached mode and talking about ideas, right? So I was really interested in um, kind of like just dropping the veil. All of these like controls and permissions around how art gets written about and whether the person doing the writing, what they disclose or don't disclose, and their whole structure of identification with what's happening in the work of art. Not just like mere advocacy, whether you're writing about something and it's kind of this positive support or you're writing about something critically, but actually, literally, because this piece is so psychological and so full of these sexual politics that you can't really sort out, it's, it seemed to me, you know, to have to do with um, a tradition of art that uses sexualized imagery, feminist art, a lot of kinds of political art, where it actually seemed useful 
for the writer and artist they're in discussion with and for the writing project to actually like put all that stuff up front and not really try to conceal it or to try to think that there is kind of a right or a wrong pathway, but to actually like use that as a kind of raw material. Yeah, it sort of owns the it sort of owns the problems in a way, right? It doesn't dissimilate. We're not like stepping outside of it. I'm certainly not yeah. stepping outside yeah, of it. it and one of the other things too is that it also in this sort of networked way that the authorship functions, I'm also, you know, in a, in a way, one of the things that the work presents is my sort of expropriating the labor of their making the photographs, Megan performing in the photographs, and all this other stuff. So it, it, I think that there's a kind of, um, I don't, there's a friction in that that's, that raises that question up, you know? I think there's part of it too that, um, you know, for, for like all the ambiguities and awkwardnesses that arise in this project, I think partly it makes evident what's going on in most mass media photos too, but we treat them, we tend to want to treat them like they're unambiguous mm -hmm. and that they're transparent and mm -hmm. that they're unproblematic. But I think like the kind of problematic mm -hmm. that arises in double bind, um, you know, if it was just like constrained to its own sphere or something, yeah. it would be a much less important piece. But it, in a way, it's um, it doesn't mirror it, um, but it, it, it's it's analogous to what's um, what's happening broadly in mass media. Yeah. Yeah. But again, for me, this happens through that implication. And the implication actually happens through that kind of like a uh, for or real privacy, bastion of privacy, you know? Yeah. That, that, that kind of like a mm, documentary promise that you mentioned before. Yeah. That as if something here is actually uh, uh, reflects a, 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 a sort of like a, almost like directly a, a certain sort of like a private relationship which gives it like a, uh, again, aspect of authenticity or a certain uh, level of kind of uh, conduit. Yeah, but well, and it makes me think like, you know, a discussion I heard recently about the uh, new Stephen Colbert late night show. Like, mm -hmm. are we now seeing the real Stephen Colbert? You know, whereas before he had a persona, um, and you know, when do we when do we get to that point, or you know, what should we assume? And, um, you know, a very similar set of questions in a way. Yeah. Um, different affect. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Should we open it up to questions? Oh. So are you. Can everybody hear? Thanks, Kate. Um, I was just, a couple of thoughts. It's, it isn't really a question, but you might have something you want to say about it. Um, that The question about the title, Double Bind. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned in a way is Megan's, yes. position, Megan's position in this. And, not that I think she's the only double bind, but I mean, in a way, she's, she is right at the center of this. So mm -hmm. that the double bind, I think, certainly refers to her as well. Yeah, I mean, and the, yeah, and I think, I think the whole project, in a sense, puts this, this sort of gender asymmetry and representation, like, in the foreground in that way. You right, know? right. And, and I mentioned this to you also, Lee, when we, I haven't read the whole conversation, but I told you that as I started to read it, I had this weird feeling, and you said that we can talk about any of our feelings, that they're legitimate, <laughs> um, that um, it was almost like Megan was a fictional character in your conversation, and it made me think about that movie Blow Up, and the woman in Blow Up, and the way, the question of whether in the end she even exists, and she's certainly the idealized woman. So that was a feeling that I got from your conversation. And um, that Megan was this kind of fiction. 
Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, Ray actually has this up. I even written it down here as a quote because I, I liked it so much this moment of like a, uh, you're, you're kind of like a nervous about whose consciousness, about what to whom is represented. I mean, that, that moment of, of, of actual, uh, something that kind of prompts you to pay attention and, and actually uh, try to identify and, and uh, but, but then in the middle of that, you're kind of losing the sort of like the track of how, like who is actually, almost like where, where does the pushback come from in a way? But I, I guess I would say with this real acting question in performance work or the event and performance that underlies photography, it's like, don't forget, forget Lee's performing all the time in his work too. I mean, right? Lee is kind of a fiction. Lee is, Lee is like well, a character in all these projects. He's, there's a whole bunch of stuff about his persona, something about him as a performer and somebody making this work that is also like very much written into this project and others. I would say, right? one, uh, I would say one other thing too, which is that part of it, there's also a limitation inherent in photography that Megan, like none of us can speak into those images or the, the voice is taken out of it, you know? So in, in a way it's like kind of looking at, um, I, th I think that's one of the conditions of photography, is that that kind of, it's like, you know, it's, it's it, a representation's presented and the person can't necessarily speak for themselves. It comes out in different ways and we're kind of trying to surround that problem in the work, actually. But that whole, like, fiction and poetry, I mean, one book that we read that was kind of really, really important to the project, but we didn't end up actually talking about it or citing it in the dialogue is Jacqueline Rose's study of Sylvia Plath and just this it's it's really an incredible example of how to deal with this voicing this kind of Plath's own self voicing but how to make really complex the relationship between Plath's biography and the things that get enacted and carried out in the poetry and in the diaries and so, yeah, I mean, anywhere where we could find a kind of complexity around and a real layeredness around these issues, things like that ended up becoming things to think in relationship with. So that, I don't think it's just, we were kind of conscious of constructing in that way. And I think it's maybe how the work operates too, is that the viewers kind of projections and their thoughts about um, or imaginings about what Megan, why Megan might be participating, what she's feeling in this all kind of get projected onto based on them not being stated, you know? They, they live in Los Angeles. They've got a kid. They, you know, I'm in close conversation with them. But. Are they represented in the book? Um. No, I mean, we didn't ask it's, them to write a yeah. forward or afterward or, yeah. <laughs> um. No, it seemed kind of beside the point because we were trying to Play, we're trying to write from the position of the viewer who's standing with the artwork and in the, in the images. We're trying to write from that side of the work, from the view, like from the imaginative and political and critical standpoint of the person who's looking at these as representations and who doesn't have access to any of that stuff. But what would it do really? What would it verify? It would only be, it's wow. a very multivocal thing. So it would just be like one more piece of talking kind of threaded into all of this different shifting talking. You know, it would be hard to know, it would be hard to know how to make something individually meaningful out of their voices. It would be kind of another project, I guess. You know, like if you have performance work and you interview participants in the performance, it's a technique and it's really interesting, but it would be a very different thing to do that, right? And then the whole way the piece of writing would get built up would be different based on using that as a research method, right? Where the participants um, had kind of equal voice to 
Lee as participant author. You know, people do it in um, anthropology and some um, people in performance studies, you know, like have worked out these kind of techniques. So it's, it's totally, totally relevant to think about what it would look like. Where, where, what would that material, you know, be like come into I mean, play? I think, I mean, I think it's that question I tried to bring up earlier about how there's a model of sort of expropriation that's put in play as something to critique and look at and, and kind of engage with and grapple with, you know. I think to, to assume by giving them a voice that everything were sort of equalized and equivalent would actually work against what the piece is, is operating as and the questions that come up around it. Can I, can I ask a related question, perhaps just about um, the agency involved with aggregation, with the kind of the point of exhibition or the or the book made for Michel Didier, where the images are brought together? That Lee, you have that moment of sequencing of deciding how the images are presented, and I wonder how that decision factors in those decisions work work, work through. Um. Wait, can you say a little bit more? Just in, just in terms of looking at the images behind you of the exhibition, yeah. then there's obviously very specific decisions about which images to show and how to sequence them on the wall, mm -hmm. and that has its own bearing on how the viewer comes to the work. Sure, sure. I mean, I think I see, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm highly, highly involved in all of the sort of curation of, of the work and the presentation of it, but I think also in a way, each one of the diptychs, um, which contains images from the popular press, and it contains images, or mass media, it contains images from, of Megan from me and Megan, images of Megan from Adam, they function as a kind of set of variations, you know? So you have maybe some sort of speculative direction put forward through the combinations of those images and how they're sort of spatialized against each other almost you know, those, those two diptychs becoming a sort of staging of, of a kind of dynamic or something, and you have, you have that exist as one sort of speculative line of logic out, and then the next time you have another one. So it's, it's kind of constantly destabilized. It's not about the construction of a kind of truth. It's more about posing problems and propositions. So it, it can get re reconfigured each time, but... Um, you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's, it's important also that I did end up making all the collages. I did end up arranging all the materials and that, that was, that's part of the dynamic of the piece and authorship in the piece. Along those lines, do you mind, uh, sorry, it's like I'm just saying a couple more sentences about the architecture of the different uh, iterations of presentation, you know? the different shows, you know, there's something about yeah. the actual spatial dynamics that are really part of the, they, they somehow enter. Yeah, I mean, I've tried like very, very carefully to present it as, I mean, it's one piece, it's all these different elements. It's, it's um, 48, dip, or 48 panels that comprise diptychs, then 10 single photographs, which were kind of there meant to be, or to kind of um, refer to the way we, understand a straight image in a way. And then the, the conceptual prompt that I read at the beginning of, of the talk and the three sort of vitrines, um, which are almost like a kind of repository of materials to kind of continue making this work out of, you know? Um, and so in terms of the installations, they tend to, it's, I've done it in different ways. I did a show at the box in Los Angeles where we built a box inside the box and inside that room was where the work was shown. So you had this kind of exterior space and then you had a sort of internal space and it, and it really cohered the piece as one object. Um, in the show at Michelinas and Nash, we did a little bit differently. There was a kind of um, 
large back room where the majority of the works were staged, which you see in these pictures, and then there was a sort of room in between this piece and another piece that functioned almost as a kind of smaller diagram of this entire work. So the actual narrative, like the conceptual script was presented in that room alongside one diptych and also a, um, a little sort of table with six of the magazines that were part of the Michel Didier um, multiple, this three volume multiple that I made. And it's, and basically those were materials, it was 479 sequenced tear sheets from the large vitrine, um, which were downshot on a copy stand. And basically as you flipped through them, you eventually exhausted the stack. So you ended up just, the little back cover of the last magazine was simply a picture of the copy stand. So there are those iterations and then, you know, so they're, they're rather immersive. You're sort of, as a viewer, stuck in the middle of it and you sort of enter the inside of the piece in a way or you're surrounded by the piece. Oh, I had a question about um, the, the personal nature of the work and there was an interview with or con conversation with you and A.L. Steiner that was that picked up on the aspect, and you mentioned it earlier, of speculation. Why these participants, um, what were their motivations for participating? And as a viewer seeing the work, um, I also wondered what were your motivations for developing the project in the first place? And just knowing your work as mm -hmm. being very biographical in nature, um, at the start, right, and that that's kind of fuel for a lot of other investigations and questions. Um, I wondered what you think about, really, what are those, I wonder what your motivation, what you wanted from the project, how it started. Um, yeah. You don't have to answer it, but how you kind no, of figure I mean, I that did, in. I can answer it, I mean, it's, it's to really, I mean, I can't deny that there's not other motivations that are complex that I might even be unconscious of, you know? Like I think that, I think to do that is, is dishonest or doesn't make any sense. Um, but the motivation really was to ask a set of questions and ask a set of questions around these themes that the material brought me into contact with. It's a kind of working through process of this. Not in a cathartic way, but in, in terms of a kind of questioning and trying to sort of understand what it meant for me, me to be a photographer making the type of work I was making, also having people expecting me in a sense to trade on my autonomy in some way and coming about to do that in a, in a sort of, you know, it, through a kind of different lens or a different sort of set of questions. And also, you know, I mean, there are also like issues of looking at my own personal experience set against these types that appear in the media, um, and then kind of group dynamics. So, yeah, I mean, it's, but, it, but it's also, it's messy, you know, it's messy. I have kind of a related, I don't know if it's a question or more of a statement, but you know, sometimes when I look at a work of art, I, I can't help but wonder or imagine sort of who, who would respond to this, or what other artists could have made this work, or, or wanted to make this work? And I, for some reason, I don't, I'm not sure exactly why, but I thought of Mike Kelly. I think Mike Kelly would have really liked this project. And the reason I say that is because Wait, Mike? Mike Kelly, I think, would have responded well to this. And the reason I say that is because, and this is kind of the irony of the work, is that it's really not black and white. That is, it presents a series of issues and problems in ways that are very ambiguous. I say it's ironic because, of course, they're black and white images on black and white backgrounds, and it's two people sharing one subject. But uh, specifically, you know, it seems to me that it has a lot to do, actually, with our relationship to the printed image and culture of spectacle. And it's often kind of demonized, but this seems to not demonize viewing mm, glamour magazines and this nostalgia of these old, of all, all these remnants that you have in there. Um, it made me think about the way that photography can do this interesting thing, which is uh, facilitate our engagement with someone in a particular way that might not otherwise be possible or that would otherwise be more difficult. 
I love the symmetry of the fact that you were together for five years and then separated for five years. And photography, this project, allowed you to maybe have this encounter with your ex-wife. And thinking of photography in that way as facilitating this difficult encounter makes me think then more positively about looking at, I don't know, say a Vanity Fair magazine, which I sometimes find myself doing. And, uh, and I feel a little <laughs> funny about it. But then I realize it facilitates a certain conversation with myself. And I appreciate that. I think it's important sometimes to look at Vanity Fair. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, it, I mean, that one other thing I would say that's like around, around those issues of like what a photograph might open onto or what an experience might open onto or even <coughs> the conceptual script, you know, like asking someone to do something for you, what that might open onto. It's in a way, in a way, in a way, there's a sort of encounter with someone else, something unknown. And I think that's what happens too when people view the piece. There's a way that I put, like, I'm sort of on a limb putting myself out there in often, in, in many cases, in a way that, that there's, a, there's a kind of heat that comes with it or something. And then the issue is that actually, you sort of know yourself through the contingencies of, of that context, you know? And I think that that's, that's this issue of, Maybe, I don't know, maybe there's but a question. I, that's not photography. I mean, that's photography unbound and affected by video and performance and all this other stuff. It doesn't really make sense to talk about that as photography with the capital P. We don't, we don't have a tradition in photography where the event and performance has been the thing. It's like all of the porousness to all the other kinds of art making that have kind of allowed Lee to be in this situation to like kind of position a use of the camera and photographs, you know, amongst these other kinds of practices and concerns. I just, I wouldn't call that photography. And people in the photo world don't call it photography and they don't write about performance, you know, or, so, or time-based issues in this kind of social and, and performative or interactive way, so. Well, maybe it's more, uh, at least the way I'm thinking about it now, that kind of idea of selfhood that kind of can be grasped only as a super fragmentary thing, or through and producing images, writing, all that sort of like a, a just as a way of, of kind of uh, almost like a grasping into possibility to kind of assume some kind of a value by kind of like a mm -hmm. actually entering the questions about value in a way. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that idea, so it's almost like through, that, this is why for some, somehow don't, uh, somehow the word autobiographical doesn't, for me, it's, it's kind of the, the opposite from that. Mm -hmm. Autobiography for me has something to do with like some kind of a past or, or certain kind of like a, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe future as well, but, but it's sort of like it has to, it's almost like a too much related to uh, uh, like a strain of personal things and, and kind of anecdotes or narratives, you know. Here we're, we're, for me, here we're encountering a real provocation. This work really kind of like a, it's almost like a, and I agree, like a, you by being kind of in the middle of it, like puts you, because you are there, I'm able to follow. Do you see what I mean? It's kind of more dangerous for me as a viewer to be there because you are kind of there with your own kind of uh, uh, body, ex husbandness whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Uh, I, I mean, there is something really kind of like uh, uh, unsettling about that, that sort of like location. To, 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 to even kind of start kind of taking it apart uh, is, is not a, I mean, and I think also should be apart I, by now. I think a similar thing goes for Rhea engaging with the project from her, right. from her perspective and her vantage and with her sets of issues and concerns. She's coming to look at the work through, you know. Um, I had a question about like the mass media and ephemera stuff they used because uh, to me that is where you had the most control over something in the project because uh, maybe you just seeked out specific things that you wanted to use and uh, I just kind of wanted to know the process of finding it was it some was it stuff that confused you about the project or you thought maybe it informed you about something or was it things that you've already had, or was it while you were shooting, or, you know? 
where and when and kind of how did all that come to you and how did you decide to use specific stuff with your photos um, versus uh, yeah. her new husband's photos? I mean, I think it's some stuff that I had. It's some stuff that, um, along with my friend Pear, we collected um, at a time in Los Angeles when you know there was you, we would go to bookstores and we would purchase things. We would purchase magazines, things that I would get from other places where I traveled. But I was trying to look at cultural media that had like that was really really charged in a way you know that had a lot of affect that dealt with these issues around sexual politics but also also dealt with other things you know so there's kind of array of you know there's straight and queer porn there's advertisements there's kind of cultural clippings and some art reviews there's um, you know different lifestyle stuff there's there's all these all these different things and you know, there's even like this crap, like advertisements for advertisements or magazines advertising back issues of magazines. So part of it was about like wading through all of this sort of muck. And I think that that was in a way also a kind of response to how archival practices were being so kind of directed at that time. You know, there was so much kind of framing and intention around taking a topical issue and making a project around that topical issue that in a way, in a way this was like, it was dealing with something much messier, but also dealing with, you know, how, I mean, it's probably important to say something about humor in the work and satire and also how some of these old advertisements would, how they were positioning themselves, you know, like how they were speaking back to sexual politics in ways that often times like were kind of going towards these really kind of conservative ways, but using humor to do that, kind of appealing to some maybe like discordant subcultural like feelings or affects or, or, or kind of, um, I don't know, subjects who kind of were in that space, but then had other kind of messages that they were kind of putting through, you know? Is there material you would not put in the mass media section? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow. Um, National Geographic? Or? And Gettys. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's National Geographic's in there. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we have time for one last question, if there is one. Um, I just want to talk again about um, what you um, really mentioned a lot of the time, that this work is a feminist work. And um, I just have a little bit, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. Um, and I think that's super interesting. So um, I just want to um, just have a little bit more clarification about it. For me, it's, if, you, if you look at this, um, um, the whole project and look at it as if it was a game, and there were like tools that were distributed, and the men have the, the kind of the cameras, and, and, and I, I see this image of Megan on the bed, and it's almost like a penetration of both, or they're both penetrating her, her image a little bit. So um, how does she kind of break that penetration and um, or how does she kind of, uh, what is her agency in it really? Can I, or, or what is the feminist aspect of how does she control? Um, yeah, kind of that um, power game or where is, it, yeah, where is the power distributed from her side? I mean, for, uh, for me, I see the feminist politics in and how Lee lays it bare and lays it forward and kind of is displaying a sexual politics uh, of representation and relationships and in photography that exists. Like it doesn't ha I understand that, that question about feminism. I mean, Rhea can answer it too, but I mean, um, you know, Part of like the issue of representation, especially of female bodies, is that you know 
there's a sort of absconding of responsibility in how the bodies are, are represented. And, and I see that Lee is not doing that. He's taking full responsibility and possibly creating problematic images, but kind of exposing the structure and the looks and, I don't know, getting us to talk about it in this way that is less um, pernicious as, you know, the, as um, what people think the innocence of photography is and the relationship of the person taking the photo and the subject that's like within the mass media. Yeah, feminism and film theory and psychoanalytic theory and art history, sometimes when it was good, taught us how to analyze these relationships, you know, around and behind and within images. Um, but, you know, look at where we are right now. Many women choose to take photographs like that of themselves. It's not like this, not like these dynamics ever go away and they can do that and call it feminist and, right, we're, like we constantly have to re-articulate these questions and kind of reframe where we're kind of trying to attributing what we think the power dynamics are and where they lie. Um, and so to the extent that feminism was, is always a project about um, producing other, artic producing articulations of politics that are being silenced, reading images, making other kinds of images to be seen and read. Um, I, just the way that we handled it in the book is that Feminist critiques were not something stable. They weren't something true. They're not something that you can learn in school or read in one book. You know, it's like a socially active set of engagements. Um, and I kind of, in almost a caricature-like way, tried to perform it in my voice as a viewer and writer, using my body, using my physical response, my sexual response, my, my um, a range of emotional responses from, from positive affect to negative affect to, to try to, and, and then like tried on a lot of the arguments that we kind of know from certain feminist discourses and kind of played them out and yet used my viewing to put some of those things into question. So, I mean, one of the things that I wanted to put into question what were these kind of um, prohibitions on um, where power gets attributed and also all these prohibitions on like kind of the internal, the fantasy projections, the desire, the pleasure that we take in sexist images, right? The, I mean, all that stuff that psychoanalysis has been good and some of the literature on pornography has been good. At, you know, Kara Walker's work is something that I absolutely go to. Like there's all this residue and all this stuff that we have to deal with, which is kind of like all the fantasy forms that sexism and racism deliver and all the images that they deliver and there's like a way of going into that material and it's not black and white and, and it's not about like sorting out the good stuff from the bad stuff. It's actually about doing something that's a lot more dualistic. Um, so, and two, if you look at another history of feminism which has to do with self-organizing and working together and collaboration, um, that has to do with play and pleasure and desire and actually like producing and reading and writing like from a space of, um, of kind of the body that's not so controlled by correct or incorrect forms of language. So those are the ways that we try to explore something that's really complicated and fraught and imperfect always to deal with. Also, there's another, oh, go ahead. No, please. Well, I was just gonna bring up the issue of um, <laughs> what it means to very carefully contextualize something though, so that you can actually you know, use it as a kind of negative diagnostic tool in some sense. So using yourself to sound something else out and then creating a framework around the whole problematic of it so that you're actually kind of, um, yeah, again, you're, you're functioning the work, uh, hopefully the work becomes kind of catalytic to asking these questions and to having the conversations and contradicting a place that we're often in right now, which is that those conversations are shut down or, um, or we pretend that we're all just on equal footing, you know? Yeah. Well, just along that, uh, at least my um, 
take on your question or, or the way I'm, I'm thinking about it is, is also back to what we talked in the beginning about this kind of idea of, of complicity. Complicity is a, is a kind of a tool or a, or a medium in this case. Uh, it, it just sort of like all oh, that kind of like re repetition or big numbers of something that you already know about or whatever. And after a while, that kind of like saturation of the field becomes like a purely, it's almost like the criticality almost like uh, arrives or arises through that. You know, in other words, there is no articulated critical position. There is no, like Megan doesn't have a camera as well, but that exactly maybe is where the, the possible, uh, you know, complicity embedded in the whole project is kind of like a, just by kind of not giving her the camera. <laughs> you know, it's almost like following, gi giving her the, uh, assigning her the place of the looked at forever, you know. Uh, and I guess too, like also the way the media imagery is integrated into the diptychs often points to the male figure as a kind of buffoon in it. You know, there's a kind of, um, you know, there's, there's, there's this issue too, you know. So. Okay, maybe that's a good place to draw it to a close. Thank you very much, Raya and John and Kate and Daniel and Lee. Fantastic. Thank you.